Okay, we're going to record to the cloud. All right, tonight I want to talk about a couple of things that, that I see. If you, if you look at any newscast in America, you would wonder about the status of our population. Is it, you know, where are we at? Um, but there's some things we need to remember for, I'm not going to get into that. That's a whole nother touchy subject, but I will someday soon. Um, what I want to talk about are promises and gifts. And I want to take it all from the Lord. There are patterns that are repeated in our Lord. And some people will say, well, Brian, you're leaning too heavily on the Lord. And my response to that will always be, buddy, that's all we got. In this day and age, I don't know how why it took the shape it has. I don't know why it's down to this, but in this day and age, as we have this resurgence, this is what we have. There's a lot of academic stuff out there. There's a lot of learned archeological research and all of that should do, should deepen and validate our faith. Because if you really look at it, there are so many more of our ancestors that were pagan than they were the Christians. So something back there worked. And we have a small piece of that right here with us now, the Lord. So I'm beginning to think between the Lord, the wounds, Tacitus, the writings of Caesar, I'm beginning to think that somewhere in there, there's probably enough for us to build the kind of successful endeavors that we have seen our ancestors do. Like I said, these were men that were willing to go out pick up an axe and cleave skulls. They would get in a boat and sail across the sea and land on a foreign shore and raise hell. And come back ready to roll. <laughs> Not all of them made it back. Not all of them came back. So many times in the tribe or the community or the village, you would have these wives who were now single mothers raising these children. Freya is there in our lore for that very reason somehow, some way, those children still came up to be what they were supposed to be in that community because the whole community was invested in their success. We've got to start thinking about how we're going to invest in each other's success instead of being right. There's some things I want to point out. Some of them are going to be controversial and I really don't care because that's my job. I'm not here to I think from last week when I raised hell and I started asking people, when are we going to start validating success? I think some people uh, got really butt hurt and left because Brian Wilton didn't buy into their fantasy. I'm not here to buy into people's fantasies. I'm here to drag as many people as I can, kicking and screaming if they need to be, into this future that is, to me, bright and worth celebrating and worth hoping for. Sometimes it feels like we're kind of all alone. I see a lot of people online say, the gods don't care about us. Oh, how so? Tell me how they don't care about you. So I'm going to point some of the things out tonight that maybe they do indeed give a rat's ass about our success. Maybe they do indeed hope that we have what it takes to join them at the table. And there's warnings in that about who we should listen to and who we shouldn't listen to. And on a strictly material plane, it works, but it also works with regards to our thought process. And I'll start off real simple. I'm going to start off in the Hindlogoth. The very first part, it starts off, it says, Freya says, Maiden awake, wake thee, my friend, my sister Hindlog, in thy hollow cave. Already comes darkness, and ride we must to Valhalla to seek the sacred hall. Right off the bat, Freya is talking. Here's this goddess of most noble birth talking to this base, simple, emotion driven, materialistic. She's probably a, an old, poor boomer, you know, in modern day's age, living in a cave, and she calls her sister. There's something important to that. There's something real important for women to recognize amongst each other that even that woman that's down on her luck is still your sister. There's still potential there. There's still hope in that. But she's seeking something. So she says, the favor of here, Father, seek we to find. To his followers, gold he gladly gives. To her moth gave he helm and mail coat, and to the Sigmund he gave a sword as a gift. Triumph to some and treasure to others. To many wisdom and skill in words. 
bear winds to the sailor and to the singer his art and a manly heart to many a hero. Well, if we think about that, that's a hell of a thing to consider. That's a real powerful reminder. When we raise a horn and we ask a gift for a gift, um, we might consider thinking outside the limits of our paycheck. Because those are some pretty awesome stuff. Her moth gave he helm and mail coat. He needed that. That was his purpose. That was the thing that most supported what he was fixing to engage in. To Sigmund, he gave a sword as a gift. And that was what he was fixing to engage in, a mighty warrior. And it went down to his son as well, who we're going to talk about in a minute. Triumph to some and treasure to others. Some people need triumph. Some people have battles they need to fight. Treasure to others. Some people will do well with that money and success that comes into this world that falls into their hands. To many wisdom and skill and word, some of us need to be wise and some of us still need to be able to talk, to use the guttural sounds from our throat in a combination of letters that will convey a message, an image, a thought, love, hate, whatever it is to ensure someone else understands you got what it takes to keep moving forward. Fair winds to the sailor. What more could any good sailor ask for? And to the singer his art, that great canvas of the imagination upon which the very best of us who can vocalize those guttural sounds and those seven musical notes in whatever combination they mean might great create a, a great canvas, a, an image upon that canvas of our imagination to inspire us to want to do many great things. What a fantastic idea and manly heart to many a hero. And how many of us, I don't know a man that listens to the things that, that I say or that I read or that Justin or Master Chim talks about or that Matt Flavelle talks about. I don't know a man that pays attention to that, that isn't doing his level best to help someone he loves and cares for get over that some kind of hump in life. Many times those men that are listening to us are finding themselves ill-equipped or they don't have the right tools, or they feel inadequate, or they're struggling to figure it out. The whole masculinity industry has been born of it. Odin gives those men, the heroes, a manly heart. Those men that step out of their way to help someone else, because we're all trying to do that. And we're all trying to figure out, man, I might not be the best equipped to do this. Like I didn't have doubts when I had a daughter. Whoa, holy shit, man. I ain't never had a successful relationship with a woman. Now I got a daughter to contend with? Whoo, come on. <laughs> Thor shall I honor and this shall I ask that his favor true mayst thou ever find to have that kind of favor from the warder of men. So not only is Odin offering these gifts to these select few, these very faithful, Thor is May you find ever he find his favor. That's the warder of mankind travels to the east every day to fight trolls and pave a way for Suna to rise in her in her chariot. Though little of the brides of the giants he loves. Well, yeah, there's some people he ain't gonna like. There's some people we ain't gonna like. That doesn't mean we are worthy to ask for his favor. From the stall now one of thy wolves lead forth, and along with my boar shalt thou let them run. So so he decided to ask Freya for blessings. And that's interesting to think about. So we know that these two gods give these gifts. We have a personal interaction from Freya. And what she does is she cuts a wolf loose on his ass. Well, that's not very favorable. But the old story kind of goes, and we see it in the lore when Loki turns into a salmon and they chase him. You know, it doesn't matter. If, if you get up in the morning, and a lot of people say, tell this story, and I'm not ashamed to tell it either. So every morning a deer gets up and it realizes he's going to have to run faster than any mountain lion if he expects to survive. And every morning a mountain lion gets up and he realizes he's going to have to run faster than the fastest deer if he expects to eat and to survive. So it doesn't really matter who you are. When you get up in the morning and it says it in the have them all, you better be running if you want to win the wealth and the success of another man. Freya reminds him of that. You can't just lay around and make offerings and say, hey, help me out a gift for a gift. You're going to have to do some work. You're going to have to get up 
put both hands to the task. And it doesn't matter if the task is something you don't like or not. Do it to the best of your ability. Greg has seen me mopping floors in a gym to make ends meet. And I did the best I could at it. Ain't no glory in that. You know where the glory was? Is that I had what it took to get in there and do my best at the task at hand. And it paid off. I continued to do my best and I moved on up in the world. I don't like it enough, I'm gonna change. That's what I did. I didn't like it enough, so I decided to change and learn a trade and go on from there. <laughs> so she says, for slow my boar goes on the road of the gods and I would not weary my worthy steed. She's not gonna give him a ride. She's not gonna pull him in a chariot. She's not gonna tire her worthy steed. She's waste the effort on a man that's not going to do the work. Here's a little incentive. Puts a wolf on his ass. And I love pointing that out because we got to remember that sometimes when we're trying to do all these things and we're trying to expect all these blessings that are lined out right there pretty clearly that these gods are more than willing to offer these gifts and success to people that have already been gifted at the beginning of the creation with, with owned oath and Lita Gotha. And then as Rig's th Rig goes through all of those generations and imparts a divine seed upon generation after generation after generation, they're still willing to give us these kind of gifts, this kind of favor. But the thing is, if we're not making the most use of these gifts that we have, these strengths that we have, if we're not willing to put forth the work necessary because I got to tell you, man, there's nothing more valuable in this world than a disciplined work effort, work ethic, to be able to get up and give it all you got. Freya is reminding him of, hey, I'm not giving you something for nothing. You got to work for some of this stuff. And people forget that. People want to lay that down. You go to any church in the world, any, any, any church, and they're telling you, ask and you'll get it. I'm, I haven't heard but one of them say you've got to do some work too well, they're walking around expecting success when you have a mindset that is centered around an expectation of success things go different for you we got to cultivate that too and it's in our law right here it says we can expect some favor we can expect to have them on our side but we got to put that work into it to make it happen not just going to show up on the back porch or in the mailbox or in the driveway. You got to put some work in. <laughs> so that's an important thing to consider. So after he makes this connection with the divine, after he's willing to put forth that work, there she is. After <laughs> she's so cute. After she's willing to, after he figures out he's willing to put forth that work, whether he wants to or not, he's got a wolf on his butt. Now he's got to keep running. Um, well, this giant test starts telling him some things. Still wagers been made in the foreign metal. Otter the young and Angantara. We must guard for the hero young to have his father's wealth and the fruits of his race. So here he is. Ever was the, for me a strine of stones he made. And now to glass the rock has grown, oft with the blood of beast was it red, in the goddesses ever did otter trust. That's an important thing to pay attention to. Because he built his faith. He put his trust in these goddesses. He did his best with sacrifice and blood and fire to demonstrate his spirituality, his faith, whatever you want to call it, to these goddesses, and they paid attention. But now they were, they're going to tell him, you already have all of this. You already have all of this in an amount you can't begin to imagine. Let me show you how. So she calls the dumbest being she can find, calls her sister, probably sweet-talking her. Freya starts sweet-talking me and called me, brother, I'm going to do all kinds of, you bet, man, come on, see what do you got. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but she says, we must guard for the hero young to have. So he's a little bit too young to understand where he comes from, what he's made of, what he's worth. Because his father's wealth and the fruits of his race are a magnificent thing. He doesn't begin to get an inkling of the value of that until after he develops the strength of his faith. 
not before, after. You won't put the cart in front of the horse saying, talking about the plight of the white man, it's not going to get you anywhere. you got to develop your faith first. first. Then you begin to understand the value of your heritage. There's a lot of us that don't know. Build the faith first. Turn that stone to glass with sacrifice and offering consistently. Keep these divine images, these ideas of the divine, at the forefront of your mind all the time. And we might begin to expect something if we'll put the work in. And that's when we're going to start to remember the value, worth of who we really are. Who are we? We've strolled across this earth and conquered everything we ever decided we want to. Now she says, tell me now the ancient names and the races of all that were born of old. She names all these tribes. They're freeborn, who are highborn, and the noblest of men, and they're all his ancestors. And when many of us begin to look at our ancestors, we begin to find great kings. We begin to find men of, of renown who have done magnificent and terrible things. That's our ancestors. Somewhere along the way, we got convinced that it might be okay to sacrifice those titles of nobility for the grand, wide open, free spaces that America holds. And we gave it up. We traded it for the security of the Industrial Revolution for the security of a job and an education and we forgot what our dreams might be we were told don't pay attention to them dreams and yet if you listen to anyone who's ever made anything of themselves they put that work in they never stopped believing in what they dreamed up all of those fortune 100 people that started companies steve jobs um, elon musk um, bill gates Warren Buffett, those people made the commitment to sleep in their office for the first three, four, five, ten 10 years that they were starting a company. There's your work effort, there's the commitment, and there's the belief in that dream. And now look at them. I wonder how many of us are willing to make that sacrifice. When I ran my company, it was seven days a week. See, because nobody's going to build your success but you. <laughs> when you ask the gods to help you out, yes, they have an abundance of gifts and all kinds of things to help you with whatever task you have at hand. If you can write, you write. If you can paint, you paint. If you're an engineer, crunch those numbers and get the, the hawk is in the angles. That's why that hawk sits on that eagle's nose at the top of Yggdrasil. It's an old Swedish saying, the hawk is in the angles. Will, you might appreciate that. Um, That's where your details are. That's where everything comes together. But we got to do the work. We got to study. We got to get the education. We got to put forth all the effort necessary. Heindle Yoth by itself is a fine example of that, but there's others too. All through the lore, that's repeated. <laughs> if we look at the Rig Thula, after they go through the generations, okay, they know all of these things. They understand where they come from. They've built a future. They've built, uh, they've gone from living in a hut with a, a a rug over the wall to, and sitting on a dirt floor to having these fine hassles, fine castles and houses with china and a door on hinges and a good floor and a nice table and they have crafts and they have skill. Each generation learns a task. They take what their father knows and they capitalize on that to become something better. Skilled craftsmen, tradesmen, and they work. They don't shirk it off. They, they work hard. That gift has been given in that line for those grandchildren to really become something. <laughs> but Cone the Young, he learned the runes to use, runes everlasting, the runes of life. Soon he could weld the warrior shield, dull the sword blade and still the seas. Bird chatter he learned, flames could he lessen, minds could quiet and sorrows calm, the might and strength of twice four men. With Rig Jarl soon the runes he shared, so he shared that with his father. More crafty he was and greater his wisdom. The right he saw and soon he wanted rig to be called and the runes to know. That's a real, that's a big deal there. So this king earns a divine title. 
he earns this ability because he learned the use of the runes. He also learned the language of the birds, which is repeated in the lore a couple of times. Odin talks to two birds every day. He knows the language of those two birds, memory and thought. Young Cone rode forth through forest and grove, shafts let loose and birds he lured, and there spake a crow on a bow that said, why lurest thou Cone the birds to come? For better forth on thy steed to fare and the host to slay. So he's out there, he's got all these gifts, he learns the use of the runes, and it's kind of like some of us. We're out here shooting at birds. We're out here taking pot shots at things that don't really matter to the future of our life. They're not really going to build success. They're not really going to give our greater wealth. It says, the halls of Dan and Damp are noble. Greater their wealth than thou hast gained. Good are they at guiding the keel, trying of weapons and giving of wounds. So when, these, when you're out there taking the shots at all these things that really don't matter to what your future looks like, these birds call him on it. Here he is with all of these gifts, with all of this wealth, with the understanding of the runes, and, and he knows the language of the birds. And they ask him, why are you out here screwing with us? Why aren't you using these tools and gifts that you have to go and uh, build a future for yourself? What are you waiting on? So he goes and he begins the kingdom of Denmark. It's what it's supposed to be. Dan and Damper, these names are largely responsible for the theory that the Riggs Thula was composed in Denmark. According to the Latin epitome of the Skeldons, Skeldon Gasaga by Angrimir Johnson, Rig, Rigus, was a man not the least among the great ones of his time. He married the daughter of a certain Damp, Lord of Dampstead, whose name was Dana, and later, having won the royal title for his province, left as his heir his sons by Dana called Dane or Danum, all of whose subjects were called Danes. This may or may not be con conclusive, and it is a great pity that the manuscript breaks off abruptly at this stanza. So it's an interesting thing to consider because those guys didn't fool around. <laughs> they were not somebody you wanted to see landing on your beach, but be that as it may, it's important to remember that after we learn all this stuff and we're wasting time walking around the woods, taking pot shot at birds or social issues that we can do nothing about, we're spinning our wheels. We're not putting the gifts that we have to the kind of use necessary to build a world, build a kingdom or name a people as we should be. So in one scenario, the gods and goddesses, after you build that faith, you are reminded of your ancestors, not before. In another scenario, those that remember that heritage and understand what they are, and they learn the language, learn the important aspects of their faith and in the runes and the language of the birds, then they begin to consider their descendants and they begin to build great kingdoms for those descendants. So there's a pattern of life that kind of emerges from different spots in the Lord. <laughs> Where else it shows up is with Odin. Now, Odin's the guy that's got the kingdom, but he loses his temper. So you have to grow if you're going to keep that stuff. You can't just learn a couple of things, stay right where you are, and coast through life. If you want to continue to move up, there's some sacrifices you're going to have to make of you. I know that I hung on a windy tree in nine long nights, a period of gestation, wounded with a spear. Dedicated to Odin, myself to myself, and on that tree which no man knows where its roots run. No bread did they give me, nor a drink from a horn. Downwards I peered. And some say that's where he fell. I took up the runes, screaming I took them. Not just walking along like picking up a lucky penny. This guy's been suffering. And then I fell back from there. Now what's important to remember It says down further, then I was fertilized and became wise. I truly grew and thrive. From a word to a word, I was led to a word. And from a work to a work, I was led to a work. Knowledge and work ethic. Understanding and action. We are our deeds. But that moment there when he's hanging on that tree, many of us have hung on that tree symbolically. I know people, I know I have found myself alone in this world with my head down, 
No bread did they give me, no drink from a horn. There's been a lot of people that I know that have been in that situation where they're not really sure where it's gonna come from next. There's a lot of people that have been isolated. There's a lot of been people been put in cages. There's a lot of people that have found themselves in a far country with threats at every turn under the same moon we look at every night over here by themselves alone. How do you suppose we get out of that? Here it tells me that I sacrificed part of who I am to move forward. There's the larger part of that story. He picks up that runes, then he hears the songs of his ancestors. He makes way for the faith to be developed in his life, capitalize on his gift, and then he hears the songs of his ancestors. And that's when he can go back to Asgard and once again be its ruler after he has built who he's supposed to be. Same thing with sacrificing an eye and getting that drink from Mimer as well, that well of understanding, that well of knowledge, the well where we all place all our hopes and dreams and ideas. Odin knows them all. That's a, that's a, that's a wild thing to consider. So once again, we have that pattern repeated. After he sacrifices that part of himself, which was holding him back from ruling Asgard, where he lost his temper, threw his spear over the host of the Vanir, and they kicked his ass. He had to go. Most of us men and women have been through life where we've lost our temper, we've done something rash, um, and we, life has whooped our ass. Life has beaten us down in some way, and we find ourselves alone. Now, are we willing to make that sacrifice of what got us there so we might pick up those runes and hear the songs of our ancestors and become that being that can rule Asgard? Or are we going to listen to the words of those people that are more certain that we're really a victim and we just don't know it? You see, because that pattern is also repeated in the lore. When we look at the Reagan's Mall, it's an interesting tale. Because here we have this son of Sigmund, who's been given a gift by Odin of a sword. And now his son is walking along by himself. But <laughs> what we're told is that Reagan was a dwarf who was skilled in magic and people were scared of him. He says, he came to Reagan's house. He was gladly welcomed. Reagan said, hither the son of Sigmund is come, the hero eager here to our hall. His courage is more than an ancient man's. An ancient man is an important thing. When you look at Leif and Leifersir in the tree, that's not one of us. That's those people from that very first generation who understands what it takes to do the work necessary to rebuild a civilization. That is life and the love of life. And that's an important concept to consider. This is the courage of an ancient man because they have life and they have a love of life. And that's something we need to celebrate too, that we have life and we love our life. What an important change in the dynamics of everything we think about if we cultivate that in our thought process. And in this tale and in another tale, we find those ideas that will stop the love of life. <laughs> here shall I foster the fearless prince. Now Ingve's hair to us is come, the noblest hero beneath the sun. The threads of his fate all lands and folds. So now he's blowing smoke up his ass, right? So Reagan was much skilled. Reagan, who said, so Sigurd was there continually with Reagan, who said to Sigurd that Fafnir lay at Nidahith and was in the shape of a dragon. He had a fear helm of which all living creatures were terrified. Reagan made Sigurd the sword which was called Graham. It was so sharp that when he thrust it down into the Rhine and let a strand of wool drift against it with the stream, it cleft the strand asunder as if it were water. And with this sword, Sigurd cleft asunder Reagan's anvil. After that, Reagan egged his Sigurd on to slay Fafnir. But he said, loud will the sons of Hunding laugh who loaded Eilimi lay in death if the hero sooner seeks the red rings to find than his father's vengeance. So, in regard to his ancestors. This is where Sigurd comes across Odin. This is where he gets the powerful information of the wedge formation, 
how to train in battle, what to look for as omens. He's given some very important information on a stormy sea, the man on the mountain approaches them, hails them as he steps on. And as Reagan cowers in fear from the storm and that storm of life. So here we have this young man who has no father, who is eaten up with anger because somebody killed his father and he must seek vengeance. The whole time he's growing up, the whole time he's learning all this stuff, he's got Reagan whispering in his ear, telling him these stories of, well, this really happened and it really belongs to me, but I don't have it and Fafnir is really your enemy. He convinces this young man that that being over there is really your enemy as well. It's nothing to do with Sigrid. doesn't have a thing to do with it. But he spends, Reagan's not stupid. He's a coward. He hides in the stormy sea. Um, he's spending all of his effort trying to convince this young man that something else is really his enemy. We get a glimpse of what it means to be courageous when Sigurd says, no, I'm not taking care of that first. I'm going to go over here and take vengeance for these bastards that killed my dad. That's when he gets to meet the divine. That's when he gets a blessing of the divine. That's when Odin himself steps on the ship, when he takes care of the business of his family. Not what this guy who's been whispering in his ear all his life is telling him, that over there is really your enemy. You just don't know it, but that's really your enemy. He kind of wronged me. He got everything. I wasn't brave enough to take it myself. That's your enemy. Let's go kill him. You see, I see that happening. We have all these gifts. We have all this potential. We have all this stuff. And we have people who are telling us, well, really, that over there is your enemy. You just, you're not aware of it yet. And that's what, what we really need to be taken care of is our family business. What we really need to be taken care of is developing that understanding of our ancestor, our faith, so we can know what our ancestors, so we can prepare for our descendants, so we can build the kind of success that will handle it all. Not focusing on what Reagan says, that guy over there is really your enemy. But it doesn't always shape up like that. It doesn't always shape up so clearly if somebody trying to bamboozle a young man saying, that guy's your enemy, go kill him. And we'll split the treasure. No, they won't. Reagan plans to stab him in the back the instant he does it. Fortunately, he learns the language of the birds. His, as he's killing Fafnir, he begins to understand that. The real dragon that, that, great, that Sigurd slays is not Fafnir. The real dragon that he slays are these poisonous teachings that Reagan's been feeding into his ears all of his teenage years, into young adulthood. The real dragon he slays is the dragon of all of these teachings is trying to convince him that something that has nothing to do with him is really his enemy. That's the dragon Sigurd slays. And once he slays that dragon and learns the language of the birds, the building of his faith, that's when he gets to go up on the hilltop. That's when he has the courage to pass through the flames. That's when he has what it takes to bond with a woman who is a daughter of Odin himself. And you know what she teaches him? She teaches him the meaning of all of the runes. And he pledges himself to her. As soon as they come off that mountain, he falls back into his old ways, he gets bewitched, and it all goes to hell after that, literally. One of the things I talk about with regards to hell, the goddess hell, is that every one of our ancestors carries a torch, Kinos, that torch of inspiration and understanding. Do you know why her realm is so valuable? Because it possesses all of the unborn dreams of our ancestors for the last couple of thousand years who never tried. Think about what that might mean for us. She's the guardian at the gate for all those ancestors who went to her realm, the halls of our ancestors, with unborn dreams and gifts they never tried to develop, with a faith that told them that the best of who and what they are resides out there instead of in here. Imagine that. Do we want to continue that thing? Do we want to continue? Do we want to show up at that doorway at the entrance to the burial mound and never have capitalized on the gifts we've been given? Owned oath and lead to both. What Riggs Thule imparted to us, what the bloodline of Gaffian imparted to us. 
but the blessings of Freya imparted to Otter. Is that how we want to end it all? No. We want to show up there into the halls of our ancestors saying, I built this, I built this, my descendants will understand they are educated, they understand the Laroons, they understand the language of the birds, my descendants will build great and mighty things because I have taught them, I have loved them, I have shared, I have developed my, the gifts I've been given to the best of their ability, might happens to be writing and talking. I can talk all day long about all kinds of stuff. What's yours? Have you ever thought about it? What? All of these lines have all these different gifts, and as they come together, well, there's two new people come together, and something unique is developed. That's you. Through thousands of years, all of that's been passed down in different various combinations, and each one of us has something special, something unique. And I know people hate that because there comes with that an obligation to not be one of the ancestors sitting in the halls of our ancestors behind that gate that hell herself maintains um, and never have developed it. So <laughs> we got to pay attention to that. Well, where else is this idea of somebody whispering in somebody's ear uh, about something else show up? Because this works at a personal level, but it also works at a mental level. All right, we're talking about Loki himself whispering into the ear, whispering into the ear of Hoder, standing at the edge of the crowd. And see, that's where it seems to be. When we find ourselves alone, standing at the edge of the crowd, in pain, blind, unable to see the world that's going on around us, we will listen. Blind people's senses are always heightened. And if we're ignorant of the ways of the world, if we're ignorant of our ancestors, if we're ignorant of our faith, we'll hear all kinds of things and take it on ourselves that, well, maybe Fafnir really is my enemy. Hmm. Well, the planned fate for Sigurd after killing Fafnir was death. Reagan was gonna stab him in the back, keep all the treasure and glory for himself. Well, he was just, he fell by the wayside. I'm not falling by the wayside. I don't want to see the people that walk this path of also true fall by the wayside either because somebody has been talking in their ear when they're in the most painful situations of their life, taking advantage of them. I've seen men do it with women time and again in this and it burns me up. And I see other men doing it to people coming in here where well, you really don't understand. Loki's whispering into the ear of odor. Odor can't see what's going on. He just tells him, well, it's a worshipful thing to take that shot. And we're told sometimes, too, that, well, it might be a worshipful thing if we take that shot, if we stand up for our race. We haven't built our faith to understand what, that, what the value of that is yet. How does that help me take care of my descendants if I lead with the chin, with understanding that I haven't paid particular attention to? I'm blind to what's going on in the world. But I hear something. And Hoder loses his life as well. There's lots of men whispering into the ears of people in Ossetru telling, well, that's your enemy over there, and that's your enemy over there, and you really need to pay attention to that because that's your enemy over there. No, 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 no. You know where else that concept works? In your thoughts. You let one negative thought come into your mind about your ability to cultivate this faith in your life and the expectation of your ability to develop these gifts, and it will shoot it down in a second. And we have been raised with those negative thoughts. We have been raised to expect the other shoe to drop. It's never going to work. Who are you to expect that? Well, you can't do that. Nobody else is doing that. Why do you want to do that? That's a negative thought. And it will, Henry Ford said, if you have one man in a factory of a thousand, and he's got a bad attitude, it will spread like a cancer across the entire workforce. And he's not wrong. It's the same thing with our thought process. What are we cultivating in our thought process? Is it an appreciation of the divine? Is it an understanding of our ancestors? Is it an intelligent approach to the preparation for a world we want to leave our descendants? 
Or are we simply listening to those poisonous words and becoming upset when someone else won't buy into our fantasy so we can pass judgment upon them and maybe build our, I'm a little bit more important than everybody else. I seem, I know, I'm, I just know. Well, poor shit. What you don't know <laughs> could fill a book. I know because I've written several. <laughs> so when we look at our lore and we say, well, that's, that's all we have to look at. There's a lot of books written by a lot of men. All of them have an idea. And I'm telling you right now that that idea of cultivating your gifts, of expectation that these gods really are on our side, that means a lot. That's when we start talking about faith. And a lot of people have that knee-jerk reaction against it. Well, that's just too much like the church. I don't want to do that. Hey, let me tell you something. If you were in one of them holy groves that our ancestors maintained and fell down, those people that fell down in that grove did not get up until they got out of it. They maintained that it was so holy that it was such a special place that they stayed on their hands and knees. <laughs> How many of us are willing to stay on our hands and knees as we move through life, doggedly trying to pursue the dreams that we have with the expectation that all of this effort will get some favor? That's what we gotta be asking ourselves. Are we spinning our wheels? Or are we cultivating something magnificent? I think today, I wanna to take a look at what I just read and what I put out, that's how I live. That's the understanding of how I live, and I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed some good success with it. I am an average, dumb redneck from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and I've written some books and sold over 30,000 of them. That tells me that I might be doing something right. They're going, people are going to talk about me. They're going to talk about you if you start following this, following things, thinking like this. They're going to say, you don't know. Who are you to say that? There's going to be academics. Well, that's not really how it went. There's going to be political radicals say, well, you're not really, you don't really possess the, the, the proper heathen worldview. You don't understand that, well, they're really all, no. What they're out to do is make money. All of them. We need to start considering that too. Build our future. Cultivate our dreams. And let's for once stop listening to things that, feed our egos in righteous indignation and start believing in ourselves. Every time I go to the gym, every time I go to work, every time I sit with my child, and I'll tell you what, that's one of the most special things in the world with me. My first son, Darren, didn't get the attention that I give Scarlett. I've had to grow and develop that. So when I sit down in front of my daughter, I look her in the eyes. I am there in that moment. What a special, amazing thing. Darren would get whipped. <laughs> Stop it, boy, go away. You know, because I wasn't valuing my descendants at that time. Now I have grandchildren and things are much different. So when I read that stuff to you, I'm not talking about some concept I think sounds good. I'm talking about the way I live. I got to tell you, I didn't come into this because everything was going great in my life. I was living in my truck after spending a couple of years doing an eight ball a day of cocaine and lost my family, lost my company, lost everything. And I was in bad shape. And I sat in the back row of a church and cried like a baby. And nobody came to shake my hand. Nobody came over to give me a hug. I didn't have a thousand dollar seed of faith donation to give. I didn't have the right jeans on. I didn't have the nice shirt on. And I smelled a little bit. And when I found this, I began to realize that there might be something in me that allows me to step up, put my best foot forward, and I might be able to reclaim some of that that I had so, so cowardly abused. To be handed a treasure of life and abuse it in such a manner, what a shame. So now I have life and I have the love of life. I'm not talking to you about this because I think it sounds good. I'm talking to you about this because this is how I live. And if you'll listen to some of it, if you'll pay attention to even a little bit of it, you might have some amazing things too happen in your life. I know some people on here right now that have had those kind of amazing things happen in their life, that have had those kind of interactions, that have stepped up to the plate, that once again have hope 
in their life that at one time may have been real sparse. A lot of it has to do with getting rid of those negative thoughts. Loki speaking into the ear of Hoder is the same thing as all of these political activists speaking into the ears of the young to get them agitated. This is the same thing when Sauron in the Lord of the Rings, the two towers, you got this big white wizard standing there. He looks important. He might know something, doesn't it? And all these Stone Age barbarians, they left you to eke out an existence on rocks. Yeah, yeah, they took our food. All of those guys get bent out of shape and they invade <laughs> like South Park. You know, they'll take our jobs. It's the same thing. We got to be aware of that. And we got to be aware that some of those people around us aren't going to know it. Only thing we can do to develop and, and stand against that is to stand up and be successful, to create a world for our descendants. And that starts and ends with me. Nobody else. Nobody else has that responsibility. I do. I also understand that if I have that responsibility, I have what it takes to make it a reality. And I hope you do too. May the gods bless you all. I'm done. Anybody got any questions? You know, we've, talk, we've been talking a little bit here the past few days, off and on. I'm trying to figure out... You know, I'm trying to figure out how we how we move forward, um, how we help some of our members move forward, help the organization move forward. And right now, all we can do is set an example. Right. Money talks and bullshit walks. I mean, that's all right. there is to it. I mean, I sit here and say all these wild and outrageous things, and uh, people got to look. Is that guy successful? Well. You want to split hairs and say, like Bill Clinton, and say, well, it depends on what you mean by successful. Or do we want to be damn successful? Because uh, I know some Mormons right now that started out lower than we did and pushed hand carts across the central part of the United States, and they're yeah. doing pretty good. Yeah, they're doing we can well. Too. We can, too. Yeah. They're, they're doing pretty well. I've spent quite a bit of time in Utah around the Mormons, and you know a lot of them are, are good folks, but they've had – through American history, they've had one tough row to hoe. I yeah. believe it used to be legal to shoot a Mormon in like Missouri, didn't it? It was up until the 70s, but that's that's where they believe everything's coming back. You know that, um, it's crazy. you know, part of it is that they consider, they consider brown and black people to be those people that um, didn't make a choice <laughs> between the devil and Jesus. It's kind of a weird thing. I don't know how to explain it, but that's, they don't, you know, they take care of their own. You see what I'm saying? You see how that came out? You know, those right. are the people that didn't make a decision. Um, hmm. So, um, we got to wonder. We got to wonder. Um, they stick to themselves. They take care of themselves. And indeed, the personal guard of Joseph Smith, their symbol was a Viking sword. I think a lot of what, I, a lot of what they do, they talk about the Viking sunstone is in their, in their faith and all kinds of stuff. We can do the same thing. And that's the thing. We got to stop having negative thoughts of, well, we really can't do that. There's too much against us. Uh -uh. Only thing against us is our own thought process. You can't do that. Why you want to do that? Nobody else is doing that. My gosh, if I'd have listened to anybody, I'd have never made it anything. I mean, I never thought that I could make six figures, mid six figures a year in my life. And I was too stupid. A students teach and B students, A students teach and B students, let me see, how's that go? A students teach, B students go to school, and C students are too stupid to realize it can't be done. I was a C student. It's too stupid to realize it couldn't be done. I was ignorant of the idea that, well, you can't get out here's, of this. Um, here's, a, here's another one. A students work for B students. That's who, it. That's uh, exactly yeah. right. A students wind up working for B students who are employed by companies started by C students. Exactly right. I think there's a lot of C students in Austin Truth. <laughs> Maybe not Brandy. I know she's smarter than shit. <laughs> um, but there's, we, I, I think we're in that point. You know, that laughter that there's nothing quite as healthy as a good belly laugh, but that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. I don't have to take things so serious. I have the opportunity to, to be happy today. Good night, man. I, 
there was a time I didn't think that would ever be a reality, man. There's a time I held a gun in my hand and I was like, hmm. And, but my descendants, my love for my descendants put an end to that. Um, it's a hard thing to realize for a guy like me today that, that has this life, this love of life. Man, what a special gift in and of itself. How can I appreciate that? How can I, how can I cultivate that so I, so I have what it takes to stand in front of my gods? You know, I think, there's a, I think there's a real important caveat that goes with, I stand in front of my gods. Well, have you become everything you're supposed to become to be able to do that? Have you cultivated the best parts about yourself? Have you made that sacrifice of ego that keeps you righteously indignant about some perceived injustice? That's Loki speaking to Hoder. That's Reagan teaching cigarettes. Um, we're warned against that kind of stuff in our lore. We're warned against it. And people, I, you know, I think Socrates says it when he's talking about Phaedrus. You know, people read these words, but they don't understand the wisdom in you know, it's like somebody, hey, I'm going to start a CD in philosophy. My gosh. If, if you can't see we have right here, no need to go off and rename it, rebrand it, and call it something new and put a shiny polish on it because you don't understand what you're reading, you know, work with somebody, find a mentor, talk with other people. And if that person's not building you up into being something and feeling good about your decision of what you're doing, you need to ask yourself, why am I wasting time with somebody that makes me constantly anxious? We live in an age of anxiety. It's the easiest thing to do. We live in an age when people write books about how everything's bad and it's, it's all going to hell and we don't know which way to go. Um, we read these, these books that, that bring that out in an age of anxiety. <laughs> it keeps us down more than anything else. It keeps our thoughts in a process that won't allow us to be more than we currently are. We've got to change that. And it's in the lore right there. I just read through some of it. And like I say, that's how I live, man. I feel pretty good about it. That's probably the problem is I'm comfortable. <laughs> Something will change. <laughs> Something will come along, kick me in the balls. Odin hands out the armor of God. He gives everybody a cup. There you go, buddy. Let's go kick you in the balls. Have a cup. All these Christians got the shield of faith. I got a cup of holiness. <laughs> that that needs to be on a shield somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's like something out of Monty Python. I'm gonna. Oh, I'm going to hell for that, man. <laughs> Somebody said I'm the next David Crash. Well, come on in. I got a fine house. Look, oh, man. Here's Jim Jones. Have some Kool Aid. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah. I don't care. Let them talk. Let them talk. That's the best marketing I could ever have. And they never have figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, man, I'm cold and uh, I'm going to get off here. But thank you, everybody, for joining me. I appreciate this evening and uh, I hope you all have a fantastic week, man. I hope you go out there and give it hell. Don't be afraid to be successful. Son of a gun. It says right there, we got what it takes. Thanks, Will. You and Melinda, take care of yourselves. Be good to each other. Thanks, Brian. Take care, Brian. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. Thanks. See you. Bye.